Good morning and welcome to the Hudson Institute. I'm Rebecca Heinrichs and have the privilege of being an adjunct fellow here at Hudson. Um, and we have uh, a very important topic today. Amid heightened tensions between the United States and China over Chinese aggression in the South China Sea, on June 7th, the PRC carried out a test of the WU-14, an advanced strategic strike weapon that travels 10 times the speed of sound, hypersonic. And this isn't the only missile of concern. After years of maintaining a minimal deterrence force, China has been expanding and improving its missile arsenal in its counter space capabilities. It has re-engineered some of its long-range ballistic missiles to carry multiple warheads and developed the DF-21 carrier killer. Additionally, the commander of U.S. Northern Command, Admiral Gortney, confirmed in April that China had deployed three ballistic missile submarines capable of striking the U.S. homeland. Today we have an exceptionally distinguished panel here to talk about some of these challenges and possible U.S. responses. I'll just give a, just a brief introduction here. Um, Dean Chang with the Heritage Foundation, Mark Schneider with the National Institute for Public Policy, and Brian Clark, Clark at, the at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments. And we will hear from them after we hear from um, our first speaker. And we do have the privilege of hearing for, from Trey Obering, who served as the Director of the Missile Defense Agency in the Office of the Secretary of Defense, he served in the military for over 35 years, including roles at the Department of Defense Acquisition Executive, managing the nation's missile defense portfolio, and as the program manager for the ballistic missile defense system. And it is my um, great privilege to uh, welcome uh, Trey Obring. Thank you very much, Rebecca. Uh, good morning, everyone. Good morning, sir. Good morning. And, uh, Thanks to the Hudson Institute for the invitation to uh, speak and address you today. Uh, as you know, the United States has fielded and will continue to improve and expand an integrated ballistic missile defense system capable of defending the United States, our allies, and forces against today's Iranian and North Korean missile threat. But this threat, or this capability is not sufficient to meet the dramatically growing threat and the environment that we will face tomorrow, which I believe will include uh, long-range missiles with nuclear warheads from North Korea as well as Iran, capable of meeting, reaching the United States and their allies with advanced countermeasures. Widespread proliferation of uh, medium-range ballistic missiles, both solid and li liquid, and increasingly sophisticated threats from both Russia and China. And we will have to deal with all of these threats in a very complex uh, and very highly contested cyber and electronic warfare domain. Now, remember that a threat consists of both intent to harm and the capability to do so. Now, a nation's intent can change relatively quickly through elections, through coups, through revolutions, but it takes years to develop capabilities. And so that's what I think that we must focus on, and let's focus on capability today. And by far, the nation that's the most active in building offensive missile capability is China. Not only are they rapidly developing and fielding these missiles, but is the, it is the purpose for which they are intended that concerns me the most. Now, since World War II, and certainly throughout my career, the strength of the United States national power has been a very strong military. The foundation of our military strength includes three very, very important pillars. The first is that we've enjoyed superior strategic intelligence, surveillance, and reconnaissance capabilities. They've informed us in crises, and they've guided us in combat. The ability to project power globally is a second key strength that I believe that our foundation is rely on. And lastly, an overwhelmingly dominant technological advantage across the spectrum of conflict. I believe that China is challenging the United States, specifically targeting our strategic ISR, our power projection capabilities, and our technological advantages with their missile programs. Now let's look at these a little bit more. The destruction of a satellite in 2007 by the designated Chinese DN anti-satellite missile demonstrated their ability against low Earth-orbiting satellites. 
Uh, one thing to note about this, by the way, is the, the angle of ascent when they hit that satellite forced much debris into the upper orbits that lasted for, for, for years. Now, according to reports recently, they repeated a low Earth orbit ASAT test in July of this year without actually hitting the target, and that possibly could have been due to the debris considerations for which they were globally criticized in 2007. Many officials also believe that they're developing a capability to reach even higher orbits, which would allow them to target nearly all of our space assets. And even though we rely heavily on space-based capabilities, we hist historically have not chosen to view space as the same way that we view air, land, and sea when it comes to protecting our critical lines of communication. As far as U.S. power projection, one of the key capabilities we've possessed since World War II is that of our carrier battle groups. These have been so valuable in terms of global deterrence and, when necessary, providing the National Command Authority the ability to strike an enemy on their soil. Here again, China has developed a medium-range anti-ship missile, the DF-21 or CSS-5 Mod-5, which is clearly and specifically targeted at our carrier battle groups. This missile is a formidable threat which rep represents very advanced technology. In terms of the dominant technological advantage we've enjoyed, and looking to the future, is China satisfied with the developments that they've achieved, or are they moving toward trumping U.S. technological advantages? I believe that the latter uh, is the case. Earlier this, year, uh, earlier this year, China confirmed that they successfully tested the Wu-14 hypersonic glide vehicle, capable of speeds, as Rebecca said, around Mach 10 on four occasions with the latest in June of this year. Now, with characteristics of both very, very high speed and maneuverability, this would be a formidable challenge to any air and missile defense system. So how should the U.S. react to these growing threats? Again, I believe that there are three thrusts that we should pursue, among others. First, we must look at dramatically revised approach as to how we develop and field missile defenses. Second, we must re-energize our science and technology programs and our state-of-the-art research at the Missile Defense Agency as well as our national labs. Third, we must treat space for what it is. It is a domain, a domain in, what, in what, which we must be prepared to fight and win. Now let me address each one of these in a little more detail. In terms of developing and fielding missile defense capabilities, we must expand our thinking beyond just thinking in terms of individual systems like Patriot and THAAD and Aegis or the ground-based mid-course defense. And we must begin thinking more in terms of integrated architectures. This includes the integration of existing capabilities to better leverage sensors, communication, and command and control. And command and control is key. It's a key to the battle space. We need rapid expansion of a common backbone. We can be using the Missile Defense Agency's command and control battle management communication system, uh, the Army's integrated air and missile defense battle command system, and the Navy's cooperative engagement systems. Those in an integrated fashion can form the backbone. And we need commonality for our friends and allies to achieve coalition and unity as well. This integration would also require the use of collaborative fire control to focus on, threat, uh, on threats in raid scenarios to maintain our intercept capabilities. And we therefore should be focused on creating a truly integrated environment in which we could use any sensor to be able to, to target, uh, to allow any interceptor to be targeted. We should concentrate on much closer integration of our missile defense capabilities with our offensive capabilities, taking advantage of the tremendous precision that is inherent in many of our missile defense sensors. This will require new concepts, new tactics, new techniques, and new procedures, as well as new training for our warfighter community. Integration of current capabilities includes collaboration and partnerships with our allies. Leveraging partner and coalition capabilities can take advantage of sensors for earlier detection as well as coordinated battle management. Now this approach can begin to close some of the gaps and help reduce costs to focus our declining budget 
on future investments. Now, I know that we often overlook it, but the BMD capabilities that we, have, that we enjoy and have fielded today are the direct result of the substantial investment in S&T and R&D that occurred between 1983, when President Reagan started the Strategic Defense Initiative, and 2004, when we began to field the first, uh, first versions of those defenses. We must revitalize that investment. And to facilitate this, I believe mature programs that are well into production should be transferred to a lead service for operations and sustainment. This would free up funding beneath MDA's top line budget authority. We should dramatically expand our investment in next generation capabilities like advanced kill vehicles, directed energy weapons, and space-based capabilities. Now, the Missile Defense Agency has started down this path, this investment, investment path, with their multiple object kill vehicle or MOKV programs and their support to uh, laser programs such as the diode pulsed alkali laser and the fiber-based lasers. And as I said, the battle space is growing into space. Failure to understand this reality could hurt us. We need new and better capability to take advantage of our deep experience in space and to defeat space threats. We must use all of our national capabilities, including our extensive space assets, and investigate what we can bring to bear from a variety of national technical means and even commercial means. By integrating a space-based layer with our existing considerable terrestrial systems, we can begin to address this growing threat environment. Now, before I conclude, I want to address an issue that has become in vogue recently entitled Left of Launch Capabilities Against the Advanced Threats. Um, now, I wholeheartedly support this concept, but this is not new. Uh, it has been around for a very long time. It's called interdiction, and it's a mission that the services have had for a very long time. I would caution that at least the Missile Defense Agency remain focused on the right of launch, which is where we only have initial capabilities that really need to be matured because no matter what you can do left of launch, if anything makes it through launch, you have to have the ability to deal with that. So in conclusion, the threats that we face tomorrow will be even more severe than today, with China challenging our basic strategic capabilities. I believe that for the U.S. to maintain and accelerate its strategic advantage, it is critically important for us to continue to integrate and innovate, including moving more aggressively into the final frontier. I appreciate your, your time. If I have any questions, I'd be happy to answer them, Rebecca. Yeah, great. Thank you so much. Um, I'm going to take a couple of questions, and then I'm going to have a couple of my own if we have time here. So I'm going to be gracious and let you go first. Um, right, the gentleman here, and then if you could please stand up and just say where you're from, that would be really helpful. It's on, but never mind. Uh, Michael Kurzig, formerly of the U.S. Department of Agriculture. The question is, are we educating enough students? Please use it. Are we educating enough students? Is our education system and our university system ready to meet the challenge that you're talking about? Because I know there's a million, 1.2 million shortage of engineers in this country and many other shortage, uh, shortages. So that's the question I have. And, and the budget answer, for that. Okay, I, I believe the answer is no. And I think that that needs to be in the entire spectrum of how we deal with national security, I believe that that's one of the priorities that we need to address. And that is, how do we in increase that interest? How do we capture uh, the, the curiosity of the very talented uh, students that we can pull them into these programs like we did in the past and historically? Are the Chinese doing that? The Chinese are not only doing it there, they're doing it here. We're educating quite a few of their students. Hi, uh, General. My name is Peter Husey from the Air Force Association. Hello, Peter. Uh, simple question. People argue that China is simply defending its interests against a bully in the United States, so there's nothing wrong with their acquisition of new military technology. Could you address what you think their strategic objectives are? Well, I, I tried to intentionally stay away from that because, as Rebecca, I am not a policy wonk like, like uh, others here. Um, and, and that's not, frankly, uh, what I'm concerned about, and that, that's why I laid the foundation at the very beginning. Look, a nation 
China could be very uh, aggressive against us today and be our ally tomorrow, okay? That, the, the intent changes. But capability is what you have to watch. Capability is what we always must focus on and not rely solely on a nation's good intent because you have to have the ability ultimately to, to protect your national security. And that's why we need to focus on the capability. Yes, sir. Good morning, sir. Otto Kreuzer, uh, Sea Power Magazine. You talked about the DF-21. You know, the, uh, they've tested the missile itself, but there's, I've never seen any intelligence indication that they've ever tested the integrated system. You know, striking a carrier battle group, which is on the move, you know, perhaps a thousand miles away, is a difficult situation. It requires the entire chain, uh, you know, and there's no evidence that they've ever tested the DF-21 entire system. Have you seen anything to, to different well, than that? Well, first of all, if I did, it would have been classified, and I wouldn't be able to comment on it, uh, frankly. But again, uh, what I was familiar with uh, in, in uniform was enough that would cause me concern to make sure that we were doing something to be able to counter that. I'm going to, I have a question. Okay. Um, uh, for the past, since the missile defense system as it stands has been deployed, current U.S. policy has been to defend, as you said, against rogue nations. Um, so we, we de designed the system to, especially GMD, the ground-based mid-course defense system, to take care of the threat from North Korea, the threat from Iran. Uh, many people are kind of, they, they're kind of under this um, misconception that that is, um, that U.S. policy requires that we do not go beyond uh, developing the system to handle just these rogue and sort of the limited threat. But actually U.S. Uh, US law um, says that we should at least, at a minimum, um, take care of these sorts of threats. So uh, can you talk about, I mean, there, there, there isn't any, um, the Missile Defense Agency doesn't have any limitations in terms of how, how advanced or how sophisticated the threats are, the threats that they're able to defend against, correct? It's going to be a matter of policy, a policy. It, it is a matter of policy, exactly. And, and the mission, if you look at the mission of the agency, is to defend the United States allies, forces, and friends against uh, missiles of all ranges in all phases of their flight. So uh, that is what they're, that, that's what they're tasked to do. Leander Bernstein, Sputnik International News. Uh, following up on, on that question, uh, the representatives from the Missile Defense Agency have said that obviously the United States does not have the ability to defend against uh, the Russian missile threat or uh, presumably the Chinese missile threat. So what systems specifically are either in development, you mentioned the, uh, the multiple, multiple object kill vehicle in development, what other systems are in development to try to reach that level, well, that it, level of threat? It, it, I kind of alluded that in, into my talk. First of all, let me tie a couple of things together. The Iranian and the North Korean threats alone, if you look at their, their uh, evolution and development, uh, they're going to get more and more and more advanced. And they're going to get more and more countermeasures. They're going to get more and more capabilities of their missiles. So we're going to have, we'll be forced to address uh, being able to counter that kind of threat no matter what we think of Russia or China. We'll, we'll have to do that anyway. Uh, and as you mentioned, uh, developing advanced kill vehicles to include the ability to do multiple object kill. Uh, integrated approaches uh, to, the, to the entire defense across the, the architecture so that we can, we can begin to do birth to death tracking with our sensors uh, and then really be able to have a much better handle on what is the warhead, what is a countermeasure, et cetera. That's the kind of approach we have to take, whether we're talking about the Iranians or North Koreans or whether we're talking about the Russians, frankly. Since the 1980s. And we haven't achieved that yet. Not. We have not, we have not been able to achieve all the foundational things we need to achieve to be able to do that. Against, again, we can do it against the simple threats today, but not against the more, more advanced threats. I think we have time for maybe one, maybe two questions here. The gentleman in the front. Uh, thank you. Uh, my name is Arnold Zeitlin. I've been teaching in China. Uh, you mentioned something about collaborating with allies. Uh, I assume the allies we have are France, Germany, and Britain. Uh, Germany should be out of this, I suppose. Uh, 
but are France and UK at all uh, investing time, money, or intelligence in this effort, or is the United States basically alone? Well, if you're talking about allies, I would not limit it just to Europe. Uh, I'm also talking about uh, uh, Japan, uh, that we actually have co-development programs and are investing a lot of money of their own in missile defense programs. Uh, South Korea is building up capabilities as well. Uh, so it's not just the Europeans. And the Europeans are very interested in, in developing capabilities in terms they, they've been modifying their NATO AWAC, or NATO AC system to be able to integrate with the C2BMC system of the United States. So they're taking steps to do that. Hi, Allison Versprilli. I'm a reporter at National Defense Magazine. Um, you spoke about the space situation at all um, a lot and how we're sort of failing in that arena right now. Do you think there's any urgency behind? Um, do you see anyone kind of realizing that this is a big problem in the government, or do you oh. still think we're? No, I, I do. I think that I think that uh, that the United States is. Uh, has recognized that they are going to have to move aggressively, and they have taken steps in the past uh, to do some foundational work. Uh, but I think that, that uh, they have recognized that we, we must protect our space assets, we must protect our space-based capabilities. Um, and I do believe that that's a thrust that we'll see coming uh, in the future uh, because the, the threats are pushing us that way and if, if for no other reason. Can I have one, too? I, um as this issue has been discussed in the past, some people will say, what I'm hearing from you is that our current system, GMD, Patriot, that we're, are basically just not going to have utility in the next you know, 10, 20 years. And I know that's not what you're saying. No. That these are, these are systems that we're still going to need, that we can improve upon, modernize, yes. adapt. Um, if you could talk a little bit more about that. We're not, you know, you're not suggesting that we move on to a different kind of No, what system. I'm talking about, and, and that's in my statement I mentioned, is integra better integrating those capabilities, integrating more sensors into those capabilities, improving the individual capabilities of the weapons, but we have to think more in an integrated fashion, integrated architectures. Because, frankly, if you have enough knowledge of where a target is coming, coming in from, uh, you can kill that target with uh, a very fa a fairly uh, simple intercept capability if you precisely know where it is. And so the more precision intelligence we can know about where the threats are and what is a warhead, what is a countermeasure, uh, the more capability we would have in being able to destroy those. And I'm not saying walk away from Aegis or Thad or Patriot, no, and not at all. I'm saying that that's where we have, to, we have to continue those, and yet we have to expand into a better integration of those capabilities as well as new ones. You join me in thanking uh, General O'Brien. Okay, thank you. I think that was a terrific um, way to kick off uh, the distinguished panel that we have now. Um, if I could just, I'm going to um, introduce each one of them a little bit more in depth, and then we'll start with Dean and kind of work our way down, if that's okay. Dean Chang specializes in China's military and foreign policy, in particular its relationship with the rest of Asia and with the United States. He has worked for more than a decade as a senior analyst and currently is a senior research fellow for the Asian Studies Center at the Heritage Foundation. Mark Schneider is a senior analyst with the National Institute for Public Policy. He specializes in missile defense policy, nuclear weapons, deterrence, strategic forces, arms control, and arms control verification, and compliance issues, and worked for over two decades in the Department of Defense. Brian Clark is a, currently a senior fellow at the Center for Strategic and Budgetary Assessments, had a distinguished 25-year military career in the Navy as a nuclear submariner and senior officer. And these um, short bios just don't really uh, do the service that these uh, gentlemen deserve, but the, there's more um, uh, in-depth uh, bios, I think, in, in your um, uh, paper there. So without further ado, Dean. Well, good morning. And my thanks to the Hudson Institute for the opportunity to be here this morning. Um, uh, and also my thanks to General Obering for uh, a great introduction, which um, helps to explain what I'm doing up here, because I'm going to be talking mostly about the evolution of Chinese um, views on military space. Um, as the general noted, uh, 
some of the key advantages that the United States has enjoyed over the last several decades has been superior strategic uh, ISR capability and global power projection. And both of those have, in fact, been rooted to a large extent in American space capabilities. Uh, we have held the strategic high ground, and more importantly, throughout the last uh, 40 years, uh, certainly in the post-Cold War period of the last uh, 25 years, there has really never been a challenger to the U.S. position in space, whether it was the Iraqis, the Serbs, the Afghans. Uh, no one really had the ability to challenge America's ability to employ space for information collection, information transmission, information exploitation in all of its various forms. Um, the People's Republic of China, the Chinese People's Liberation Army, constitutes a fundamentally different approach and will, in fact, in the event of a crisis war conflict, pose a very, very strong challenge in this regard. Uh, my comments today are basically going to take a look at some of the more recent uh, Chinese writings on the subject of military space. Uh, these are coming uh, not simply from random articles or uh, postings on blogs. We know that that is uh, not exactly the most reliable of sources. The internet's a wonderful place. You can find out all sorts of things, and some of it is sometimes even true. <laughs> um, rather, it's derived from things like the Chinese uh, Defense White Paper, which came out at the end of May uh, this year, the recent Chinese National Security Law, which was in fully enacted uh, in July of this year, the Science of Military Strategy, one of the PLA's textbooks published in 2013, uh, new Chinese military teaching materials, uh, which began publishing in 2011, and of course, comments by Xi Jinping, the Chinese leader, who, for example, in April 2014, called for a greater integration of air and space capabilities. To begin with, it's important to understand how the Chinese military views future warfare in general. Uh, the Chinese characterize this as local wars under informationized conditions. Uh, what this means is that information technology uh, plays a role in every aspect of military operations, not just the cool video parts of a bomb going through the second window on the left, but also such mundane things as logistics, personnel records, uh, communications, uh, management of of your own forces, where are they, as well as identifying where adversary forces are. Uh, in this context, the Chinese have concluded that future warfare will be characterized by integrated or unified joint operations. So the PLA is expecting to fight a war that will span at least five domains, the traditional land, sea, and air, but also outer space and cyberspace. It expects that its forces, uh, the ground forces, the PLA Air Force, the PLA Navy, the second artillery, as well as its space and cyber capabilities will be operating as a unified team. The general talked about creating an architecture. The Chinese also think about fighting conf future conflicts as battles between rival arrays of systems of systems. So it's not just system against system, it's arrays of systems against arrays of systems. And in this context, the space battlefield is of increasing importance and decisiveness because of how much information is collected from space, how dependent particularly the United States is on space platforms for transmission of information and also on exploitation of space. Um, in this regard, uh, the PLA has laid out an interesting array of basic principles for space operations. Um, in the Chinese hierarchy of military science, uh, it is very important to establish, because war is scientific, it's a good Marxist-Leninist approach. If it is scientific, there are knowable rules. If you adhere to them, it doesn't mean you're guaranteed to win, but it's a way of analyzing. You as a commander, you as a planner should keep certain laws, certain principles in mind, because they will help shape and guide you towards the right answer. Some of the basic principles for space operations that the Chinese seem to believe uh, will be in play are the importance of fully preparing for space conflict that this is not someplace where you can sort of hope and wish that it won't happen. Um, you need to have a unified command. Again, it's not just sort of random pot shots of things that are in orbit. You have to create a 
battle plan from start through the course of the entire conflict. It's not going to be just in the opening phases. Uh, integrated joint activities, integrated uh, offense and defense. So it is important to think about defensive operations in space, making sure your space assets survive as much as it is important to go after the other side. Um, grasping combat opportunities and placing an emphasis on stealth and surprise and having tight coordination among all of the various command structures because space by itself actually isn't that important. What matters is the information that flows through space and the ability to exploit space in the service of ultimately the war's ends, that is the political purposes and goals. Interestingly, we see an evolution in Chinese concepts of space operations, uh, the kinds of missions that the PLA would want its space forces to do. And most importantly, over the last 10 years or so, what we have seen is an increasing emphasis on space deterrence. Um, one of the interesting things about the 2007 anti-satellite test, as the general noted, was that there was an awful lot of debris that was generated. In fact, it was probably the worst single space debris generating event since 1957. Many of those pieces, uh, and we think that there's anywhere between one and 10,000 pieces, depending on how large they have to be to be significant, but suffice to say, many of those pieces will be in orbit for over a century. The International Space Station has had to move at least once, I believe actually several times, to dodge pieces from that test. The interesting part about this is that in textbooks that were published in 2004 and 2005, Chinese military textbooks, they discuss the importance of demonstrating space, capa space weapons capabilities. What this suggests is that, since I don't think the Chinese have yet perfected time travel, um, they're working on a lot of things, but I think that one's somewhat lower priority. Uh, the Chinese seem to have laid out an argument for why you would want to demonstrate the ability to kill satellites, which they know would generate debris, before they actually killed a satellite. That's very, very sobering because a lot of folks have made the argument that maybe the Chinese didn't know what was going to happen. Maybe, maybe they just sort of didn't really do all their math homework, which would be a first for many Chinese. Um, but instead, what seems to have occurred, if we look at the basic timeline of what the Chinese said they wanted to be able to do and when they did it, they demonstrated a capability, and in the process of generating an awful lot of debris, demonstrated to the world, we have this capability, which is a fundamental part of deterrence. Do you have the capability? Do you have the will to use it? And do you communicate both of those elements to potential adversaries? Um, so that's the doctrinal aspect. Let me very briefly talk about some of the capabilities that we see the Chinese doing. The Chinese have talked about deploying up to 120 new satellites by 2020. This includes a significant array of remote sensing uh, systems, many of which are going to be small satellites, as well as a fully fleshed out uh, position navigation and timing constellation, the Beidou system. The Chinese around 2000 deployed an initial Beidou system comprised of geosynchronous satellites that was active. You took a little handset, you pressed a button and sent a signal out to geosynchronous satellites, bounced to a ground station, it measured the differential between the various signals that were coming back, and then it sent a signal back to you saying roughly where you are. Not the stealthiest capability. The new Beidou, uh, which was for a while known as Compass, is much more like GPS. It is passive. You have a handset, and it basically will pick up signals that the constellation of around 30 mid-Earth orbit satellites constantly sending out signals will basically tell you where you are. Um, this is a significant improvement, obviously. The Chinese are deploying a series of new data relay satellites. Um, China currently is mostly reliant on ground stations uh, to monitor satellites and to also pick up information, so a larger constellation of uh, data relay capabilities will provide them with significantly uh, better coverage. Um, interestingly, we think that China may be developing, finally, missile early warning satellites. And this is, should be a very striking and rather sobering and useful reminder. China's space program has never looked like that of either the United States or the Soviet Union or Russia. Um, for both the US and the USSR, one of the early priorities was developing missile early warning detection. Is somebody launching a missile at me? China has the technology to do this, 
But up until the present, we have never seen any open source indication that the Chinese were interested in employing early warning satellites. Now we think that they may be working on something like that. Uh, the Sijian 11 um, small satellite we think may have had such a capability. And finally, interestingly, the Chinese have long expressed grave concern over the X-37B, uh, which they characterize, among other things, as a spaced ground delivery system. Um, interestingly, the Chinese have apparently been working on something called the Shenlong, which appears to be a space plane somewhat similar to the X-37B. Uh, so in conclusion, um, basically to reaffirm what uh, General Obering said, the Chinese in particular are working on an array of space-based capabilities. Um, they have, as important, developed a doctrine that would govern how they would employ space capabilities. And to their mind, the ability to establish space dominance is a fundamental part of the ability to fight and win future local wars under informationized conditions. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dean. Mark? Thank you. Uh, I'd like to uh, thank Hudson um, Institute for um, giving me this opportunity to speak uh, to you uh, today. We know a great deal about China, but there's also a great deal uh, that we don't know about them. Uh, the annual uh, Pentagon reports on China and testimony from the Director of National Intelligence uh, says that they have a major nationwide concealment and deception program underway, but that this is essentially um, ignored uh, in most of um, the commentary you see um, in the United States and the West in general. Um, I think the biggest uh, Chinese deception is the idea that there's going to be a peaceful rise of China. I don't expect that at all. Yeah, could you pull your microphone a little okay. bit closer to you, or the other one, the one on the left? Okay. The one. Yeah. Thank you. Now, uh, at the end of the uh, Cold uh, War, the uh, military threat to China essentially uh, evaporated with the demise of, of, the, of the Soviet Union. The Chinese response to that was to introduce uh, double-digit increases in defense spending, and for the last 20-something years, there's, it's happened 18 of the last 20 years. So uh, this is rather un unprecedented. And a lot of this, of course, um, is reflected in, in the missile and nuclear modernization programs underway, but it's much broader based um, than that. Now, um, according to the Pentagon report, uh, China is aiming at, quote, winning short duration, high intensity conflicts against high tech adversaries, end quote, and uh, the high tech adversaries are obviously the United States uh, and Japan. Uh, Chinese uh, have a fairly advanced nuclear weapons technology. It's not as, as advanced as the U.S. Uh, or um, Russia. But uh, they have uh, continued uh, after the Cold War to develop improved nuclear weapons. Um, the, they uh, did overt high-yield nuclear testing through uh, 1996 and reportedly covert nuclear uh, low-yield testing after. Uh, 1996. In the year 2000, um, the uh, Chinese Central Military Commission, which was the is the main defense decision-making body, was uh, purportedly uh, briefed on quote the further development and further development of uh, Chinese uh, nuclear capabilities from 2001 to 2009. Um, there, this appears to have actually happened. Uh, in June 2001. Um, the chief engineer uh, who the Chinese government says um, developed the neutron bomb indicated that the, uh, the uh, 2000 or July 2000, uh, 1996, excuse me, uh, Chinese nuclear test uh, was, in his words, a great spanning leap in nuclear weapons technology and allowed for the miniaturization of nuclear warheads. And if, and if this is true, of course, it has tremendous relevance to, to the merving of uh, the uh, Chinese uh, strategic nuclear force. Uh, the number of Chinese um, nuclear weapons that exist um, today is subject to major dispute. Uh, numbers go anywhere from a few hundred up to a few thousand. Uh, the biggest uh, area of dispute is how many theater or tactical nuclear weapons the, the Chinese have. Uh, the Merving, uh, long-term Merving plans is also subject to some uh, dispute. 
um, the um, Asian press has been consistently reporting uh, for the last really 15 plus years, Chinese uh, plan a major um, uh, deployment of MERV capability, uh, a number that has appeared several times uh, since 1998, I believe, uh, is 576 warheads on the uh, Chinese submarine launch ballistic missile force. The Chinese um, underground Great Wall, which they describe as 3,000 nautical or 3,000 miles of, of underground missile tunnels for mobile ICBMs, is, is simply astounding. It would be absolutely insane to build anything like that uh, unless you plan a massive force of, of mobile uh, ICBMs, and it has the effect of denying us um, information on the actual size of any of the Chinese uh, mobile ICBM inventory at any given time. Now, uh, China has a um, incredible array of um, ballistic missiles. I mean, you really have to put this in, in perspective of the U.S. program, which has uh, one ICBM of 1970 vintage and one SLBM of 1990s uh, vintage. Air Force Intelligence, National Air and Space Intelligence uh, um, Center, um, in a 2013 report indicated uh, that there were 18 um, types or, and variants of Chinese theater um, missiles, four uh, types of ICBMs and two types of, of SLBMs. Numbers from the, um, this year's Pentagon report um, include over uh, 1,200 um, short-range ballistic missiles, two to 500 uh, medium-range cruise missiles, 75 to uh, 100 medium-range uh, ballistic missiles, 20 intermediate range ballistic missiles, and, and 50 to 60 uh, ICBMs. I suspect all these numbers understate actual uh, Chinese capability. Now the, uh, the report uh, itself um, says that uh, China is, quote, developing and testing several new classes and variants of offensive missiles, including hypersonic glide vehicles. And China continues to modernize its nuclear forces by enhancing silo-based intercontinental um, missiles uh, and adding more survivable mobile delivery systems. Now, China has basically three classes of, of um, ballistic missiles. There are missiles that are nuclear armed, in other words, exclusively nuclear. There are nuclear capable systems, which are dual capable, have nuclear and conventional warhead options on them, and there are conventional missiles. And, and China has reportedly um, achieved uh, both precision um, and near precision accuracies, uh, accuracies in, in the, or circular error probable in, in the 10 to 30 meter range for a number of uh, these systems. Now, the, the new nuclear arm systems um, that have been produced within the last uh, 10 years include two variants of the legacy CSS-4, or what Chinese called the DF-5 ICBM, including a MERV uh, variant. Uh, includes the rolled mobile DF-31 and DF-31A uh, ICBMs uh, and the JL-2 SLBM. Um, and, which is carried by a Type 094 submarine, with, uh, both of which are um, about to become operational. Um, four, uh, according to the Pentagon report, four of the eight planned Type 094 submarines are now operational. Um, China also has a number of um, uh, nuclear, strategic nuclear uh, missile systems on the development. Uh, Chinese, um, uh, this includes the DF-31B, according to Bill Gertz, which he says is, is the MERV system. Uh, the existence of the large DF-41 ICBM, road mobile ICBM, has con been confirmed by the Pentagon, um, and it's reportedly capable of uh, carrying 10 uh, warheads. Now, uh, Bill Gertz did a very interesting story on it. Um, uh, just yesterday, and uh, China Commission says it will be uh, operational this year. Now, the, uh, the Chinese, uh, according to Asian press reports, have two, um, um, uh, one, one or two, it, it may be the same missile, uh, but uh, the, the basic report is they're developing a MERV uh, submarine launched ballistic missiles, either a variant of the JL-2 or something called the JL-3. And the Chinese are producing the H-6K 
bomber. It's a derivative of an old Soviet um, uh, medium um, bomber, but it's been very seriously updated, and, and it carries nuclear-capable uh, long-range uh, cruise missiles. Now, the uh, China uh, China has a number of nuclear-capable theater missiles. The 2011 Pentagon report uh, said that the DF-21D, the carrier killer, uh, is part of the nuclear uh, force, which is a very interesting development, to say the least. China has said that its new uh, IRBM uh, is nuclear capable. Uh, Bill Gertz says that's the DF-26. Uh, uh, Air Force Intelligence, in its 2013 report, um, says uh, that uh, the uh, – well, excuse me, uh, Air Force Intelligence uh, in, in – um, testimony before the China Commission uh, says that the hypersonic boost glide vehicle is nuclear armed. And uh, a number of press reports um, say that the uh, DF-25 uh, medium range ballistic missile uh, is nuclear capable. So the, 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 ch the Chinese also have um, a series of missiles that they stated in their 2006 um, white paper. Uh, they call them tactical operational missiles of various types, and tactical operational is Soviet terminology for battlefield tactical nuclear missiles of short range. Um, you won't find this in the in the Pentagon report, but the uh, Chinese Defense Ministry has, has uh, the Taiwanese Defense Ministry uh, has stated that three of the the known uh, short range Chinese ballistic missiles are actually uh, capable of delivering nuclear chemical or electromagnetic pulse warheads. So we may have a nice little surprise out there on our hands. Um, Chinese doctrine with regard to nuclear weapons uh, use, first use is allegedly no first use. That's nice, but if you take a look at the actual wording of the, the Chinese commitment, um, you can't possibly violate it if you're Chinese. I mean, uh, you can use nuclear weapons first. Uh, it's very cleverly worded. In my view, it's, it's, it's complete propaganda. Uh, in 2004, the uh, Second Artillery, which is the Chinese ICBM force, published an officer training book that's become available in, in the West, um, and it talks about uh, changing um, uh, the nuclear threshold in time of war, and it says that the Second Artillery has been directed to maintain the, the, the ability uh, to launch a first strike in any um, military conflict. In 2011, um, Jap Japan's Kyoto News Agency, which is a major Japanese uh, news agency, um, says it obtained classified um, Chinese documents uh, saying they're going to adjust their nuclear threat uh, uh, use policy in the event of war. Now, uh, China, China does not make nuclear threats on the scale of, of, of of the Soviet or Soviet or Russian Russian Federation, excuse me, but it does. Um, Chinese generals do periodically threaten uh, first use of, of nuclear weapons, and uh, a classic example of this occurred in 2005 with the U.S. Uh, Secretary of State in Beijing in a, in a major visit. Uh, a Chinese general uh, declared uh, that if if we defended Taiwan, uh, they would hit us with several hundred nuclear weapons on targeted against our cities. Uh, in November 2013, uh, several state-run uh, publications in China ran essentially the same story, uh, which um, talked about targeting uh, large numbers of American cities with nuclear weapons, illustrating the aim points uh, and the fallout patterns, and claiming that each China s Chinese submarine uh, could inflict uh, 5 to 12 million casualties on the United States. And in December 2013, a similar uh, story was run in, uh, China, in the Chinese media about the ability of the H-6K bombers to launch nuclear cruise missiles against U.S. bases in South Korea and Japan. Uh, thus, we have a very serious and growing Chinese missile and, and nuclear threat, as well as a very, very uh, serious conventional strike capability, uh, which is which is being uh, uh, improved uh, um, consistently, uh, and uh, this is in the context uh, of what's going on. For example, 
uh, in the South China Sea right now. This is a very, very serious missile threat. My personal view is it's the, long, it's, it's the greatest long-term threat uh, to, to U.S. security. Thank you. Thank you, Mark. Um, Brian. Uh, all right, so uh, we've talked a lot about uh, the threat that Chinese uh, capabilities might pose to two traditional sanctuaries that we've uh, considered in the United States. So one is the homeland, and just talked about the homeland ballistic missile threat, and, and the threat to our space capabilities or the space capabilities of ourselves and our allies. I want to shift focus now and talk about the Chinese missile threat as it applies to our four deployed forces and our allies in the region, you know, particularly the Western Pacific. Uh, the reason why this is important, and we shouldn't ignore ignore it when we talk about you know, threats to the United States is uh, the Chinese uh, objective strategically is to try to use their missile forces to reinforce a belief on the part of our allies that we would not be able to come to their aid uh, were the Chinese to pursue some aggressive act against them. So if, if the, the Chinese can convince Japan, Korea, you know, Singapore, whomever, that the U.S. won't be able to arrive in time or arrive in sufficient force to defend their interests, they may walk away from some of the alliance relations ships over time uh, that, that we have with them, which, you know, is, ex which is the, the long-term objective of, of China when it comes to the region, is to you know, reinforce their sense of hegemony over that uh, Western Pacific. So uh, we can't discount the threat you know, to our four deployed forces when we, we focus on the ballistic missile threat to the United States, and both have to be considered. So that's what I wanted to look at today. The, to put it into some sense of scale, what are we talking about here is this chart uh, I built to show on the top here is the defensive capacity of our four deployed missile defense forces, both on the ground, meaning Patriot batteries, and at sea, meaning our cruisers and destroyers that operate in the Western Pacific. So these are the things that are based out there day to day. And I gave them a pretty generous assumption with regard to how effective they were going to be. And then I loaded them out in a, in a way that's consistent with how they're normally loaded out. So you, you, you've got the ability with all of those uh, assets deployed to shoot down about 1,700, 1,800 missiles of, of various combinations. On the bottom, I am showing the number of missiles that uh, the PLA uh, has available that they could launch all at once. So these are the, essentially the number of launchers that are available to the PLA on any given day of the week in the Western Pacific. Uh, the, again, with all kinds of missiles. So it's, it's the runs the gamut from surface to surface cruise missiles all the way up to ballistic missiles. And so just to get a sense of the scale, I mean, obviously the specifics would be very different when you look at you know, particular defensive systems against particular threat weapons, but to get a general sense of it, this gives you a way of comparing them. And if you look today, we got about, they've got about 1,500 missiles that could be launched uh, all at once if they chose to do so. <laughs> Uh, and then, uh, which is, you know, a little bit less than the capacity we have to defend. So we're maybe not such an, in a bad situation today. But that changes over time, as one might expect, as they build up their missile forces. And right now, our program of record does not change dramatically in terms of the capacity of missile defenses that we're going to deploy to the Western Pacific. Uh, this may make it more incumbent upon allies, obviously, to contribute to it, uh, but it sort of gives us a sense of the fact that the surface-to-surface the -surface missile threat is going to be significant and growing in the Western Pacific, and it will overcome our ability to defend against it relatively soon. Uh, so what I want to get at today is, well, what are, some, what are some things we should do about that? But one other element that we need to consider is the fact that uh, missiles are only you know, one component of the Chinese air threat. Uh, and if you look at the Chinese strategy, their strategy is to use missiles, both ballistic and cruise missiles from long range, uh, in an attempt to paralyze U.S. bases and, and ships, for places from which we would project power, uh, and then to follow up with uh, airstrikes to annihilate. So it's a paralyze and annihilate strategy. Let me uh, do, 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 build that out. All right, so what this shows is uh, the, the comparison of Chinese missile forces to Chinese overall uh, strike capacity in the Western Pacific. And if you compare a battery of ballistic missiles to one uh, fighter bomber, <laughs> they've got about the same payload is available on each. And so if you're looking at the Western Pacific, where fighter bombers can reach and ballistic missiles can reach, the, uh, the capacity that you're facing in missiles, which is this red stuff down the bottom, is much less than what the PLAAF, the PLA's Air Force, can deliver in one day. 
and this tan area up in the top is how much payload the PLAAF can deliver in one day of strikes against targets you know, in the Western Pacific out to 1,500, 2,000 kilometers or so. The PLAN is a component of this as well, and so their surface-to-surface -surface missile capacity is represented here. So you've got a pretty significant capacity of missiles, but it's dwarfed by that of the PLA Air Force. Uh, so if you're looking at U.S. forces and allied forces in the Western Pacific, you have to think about both defending them against missile threats as well as against air threats, because you could, you could survive the initial missile attack only to be wiped out by the subsequent air attack with bombers. So you gotta have both. You gotta be able to defend against aircraft and missiles, uh, but our current defensive strategy for how we do air defense doesn't distinguish between the two. So today, when a airplane or a missile comes at a US base or US forces, we treat them all relatively equally, and we try to shoot them all down using the defensive systems at hand as far away as possible. Well, we could end up in that situation using all of our best long-range missile defenses against relatively cheap and numerous missiles that the Chinese could develop. So if they're smart, they would send a bunch of cheap ballistic missiles or cheap cruise missiles over first, use up our defensive capacity of long-range systems against those, and then follow it up with waves of more expensive and more capable weapons that would take advantage of the fact that we have a window in our defenses that's been opened up by their initial attacks. So we have to think about a way of defending against both the aircraft and the missiles and do it in a way that's more efficient and maybe better allocates defensive weapons against offensive threats. So one, one thing we can do there is when we're thinking about the, you know, the Navy, what should the Navy be doing is uh, separate our defenses uh, against platforms that would launch missiles from the missiles that they launch. You know, so a strategy of separating archers and arrows. Uh, and if you think about the uh, effectiveness of uh, attacking the archer, it's going to be much more than attacking the arrow. If I, if I shoot a PLA aircraft with a SM-6 missile or a ship with an anti-ship missile, I'm going to get rid of all the missiles that this guy also has with him and his capacity to go back and get more missiles. So the, the, the uh, follow-on effect in terms of missile defense is very significant if I can take out the platform rather than waiting for the missiles to be launched and taking them out. So, but I have to be deliberate in how do I you know, target them and do that separately from my defense against missiles. Because otherwise, he'll send the missiles in first, we'll defend against those at this kind of range, use up all of our long-range defensive assets, and then be left with nothing to, defend, to, to attack the target uh, afterward. So we've got to husband our long-range systems to be able to use those against platforms, uh, as opposed to using those against the missiles. So we've we got to go, go towards a long-range system being used against platforms. Uh, this also kind of shows the ranges of the various systems that are involved here. We, the U.S., when it comes to shooting down platforms, enemy platforms, enemy ships, airplanes, missile launchers, we're at a distinct disadvantage in most situations. You know, our our anti-ship missiles are half or less the range of the competing anti-ship missile that the, the Chinese have developed. Our air defense weapons, uh, until the introduction of the SM-6, are uh, about half the range of the anti-ship cruise missiles that the airplane, airplane could launch at us. Uh, so we're faced with a situation today where you know, I've essentially got to wait uh, for the weapon because I can't shoot down the platform before it arrives at its uh, weapons launch point. So I need longer range weapons so I can attack these platforms before they can launch, but I also need to husband those weapons to ensure I don't waste them on missiles instead of platforms. And then when it comes to defeating missiles, I need to shift to a concept of doing that at much shorter ranges than we do today. Today, uh, a ship or a land base will tend to try and use the longest range system possible, a Pac-2 or a THAAD on the, on the shore, or a uh, SM-6 or SM-2 on a ship, to defeat an incoming missile. Well, those are the most expensive, largest weapons that I have for defense. And so I'm gonna use those preferentially against the incoming weapons, uh, which I have no idea how expensive they are. They may be, it could be a cheap uh, you know, $600,000 cruise missile, you know, or it could be a multi-million dollar cruise missile. You know, we don't know necessarily when we're attacking it. So we could end up in a very poor cost exchange ratio, where for example, I'd be using an SM-6, which costs almost $4 million, to defeat a BrahMos cruise missile, which costs less than two. You know, and I can't do that very long before I start to real, spend myself out of being able to do missile defense. So shifting to a shorter range uh, air defense umbrella, so shifting from 100 miles or more, like it is today, 
down to about 30 miles or so would allow me to use a lot of different weapon systems for defense than I do today. I would be able to use cheaper and uh, smaller uh, interceptor missiles. Uh, the uh, Evolved Sea Sparrow missile, PAC-3 is a perfect example of this, shifting to a, a shorter range scheme where I can use more numerous missiles. Uh, the PAC-3, for example, can fit four to a launcher that would normally carry one PAC-2, but the range is about half, so you end up having to do this defensive uh, scheme much closer. Shifting to a shorter range defensive scheme also enables us to start bringing on some of the systems that uh, General Obering was talking about. You talk about directed energy like high power microwave, lasers, uh, or even electromagnetic railgun, which is an electric weapon. All of those systems only operate at shorter ranges. You know, a laser is a line of sight weapon. I can't shoot a laser over the horizon to reach a missile at 100 miles away. I've got to use it within you know, 10 to 20 miles because the missile will be close to the horizon and I, can all, I can't you know, bend the light around the horizon. So the laser, the high power microwave, and electronic warfare all are going to have to operate at shorter ranges. Well, today, I would use those systems as a catcher's mitt you know, for the missiles that made it past all of my kinetic interceptors out here. If we shift our defensive scheme into where those systems can actually contribute instead of an interceptor, then I'm able to increase my defensive capacity by using the laser instead of an interceptor, uh, whereas today I would use the laser and electronic warfare only as a last resort. And then I would have my self-defense uh, scheme right here with, you know, at five miles or less, which is consistent with what we do today. We have a bunch of point defense systems like rolling airframe missile or Sea Whiz, a gun that shoots, you know, lots of uh, depleted uranium rounds. Uh, those are the things that we use at less than five miles just uh, as a point defense against potential threats. But this, this split between offense being done at longer ranges and defense being done at shorter ranges is essential if we're going to increase the defensive capacity available on our shore bases and on our ships. Because magazine capacity is at a premium, even if you're on shore, and cost is a big, big deal. So you've got to be able to shift to a cheaper, shorter range interceptor if you're going to do this. Uh, and then the only way, the only way you're going to use these new technologies like lasers is if you shift to being doing, doing air defense in much shorter ranges. Uh, what that might do on a ship, so just to look at an example of how that plays out in terms of your capacity on the ship, this shows the vertical launch system magazine loadout notionally of today's uh, destroyers. So it shows how many missiles of each type are in there and how much defensive capacity you have. So. Defensive uh, air warfare systems that we have today, like the SM-2 missile, you might have 32 of those. ESSM, you might have eight cells of those, and there's four to a cell, so it's 32 missiles total. So you've got that much defensive capacity. If you shift to this uh, shorter range defensive scheme, you could then put the bulk of your defensive AW into ESSM, and there, thereby increase your defensive capacity significantly and take advantage of new technologies that are being incorporated into ESSM to make it more effective. You could increase your number of SM-6, which could be used as an offensive missile, so it's able to reach out at enough range to shoot down an airplane before it can launch its cruise missile at you. And then you could add more uh, offensive weapons you know, down here by having multifunction, multi-mission weapons like the long-range anti-ship missile, which might be able to do land attack as well and not have to have a, a separate tomahawk and harpoon as we do today for those two missions. The, so one, one part of this is increasing the defensive capacity of our individual units, our ships and our shore bases. The other thing is, well, I need to provide more assets for missile defense in general. Uh, one way to do that is to install Aegis Ashore type installations in more places. Uh, the Aegis Ashore is a relatively inexpensive way to provide uh, ground-based uh, missile defense for uh, notionally ballistic missiles right now with the SM-3 interceptor, which the uh, Japanese are co-developing the latest version of. You could also use that vertical launch system ashore to put in uh, smaller missiles, so you could use it to launch ESSMs or SM-2s or SM-6s. But by installing a couple of those or three of those in Japan, you would relieve a lot of the demand signal on today's destroyers and cruisers, which today do this mission by just driving around in a little chunk of ocean off the coast of Japan you would free those ships up to be able to do air defense and missile defense more generally rather than being tied down to a very small location uh, where they can do a limited missile defense mission for the, the territory of uh, Japan. The other thing we need to do is think about um, relieving some of the, the alternative, the, the demands that would take our uh, missile defense ships away from their missile defense missions, which uh, gets to uh, the fact that they would uh, right now 
if we got into a conflict, our large surface combatants, our cruisers and destroyers would have to do escort missions for carriers, or not carriers, but for uh, convoys and logistics ships. That's because our, we don't have anything else that can defend them against air threats. Uh, today, uh, our small surface combatants are uh, not capable of doing air defense. And just to show you what this chart shows, is the blue stuff here is the number of cruisers and destroyers that the Navy plans to have in its shipbuilding plan between now and, and you know, 2044, the 30-year shipbuilding plan. So that number is, hovers around 88, which is the requirement, which is this number right here. So that's pretty good. The tan stuff is the Navy's small surface combatants. They're frigates, they're littoral combat ships, they're minesweepers, they're, they're well, patrol craft in some counting methods, but uh, usually not counted. So frigates and LCS are in here. The uh, requirement for those is up here at the top, which is that line. So you can see today there's a huge gap between the number of, of, of them that are available and the number of them that we need, which means that the large surface combatants, the cruisers and destroyers, are going to get pulled in to do those missions, which means they're going to be taken away from their opportunities to do missile defense, air and missile defense, in support of the joint force. That's one problem we need to address. The other problem is the new frigates that are being developed by the Navy are not going to have the air defense capacity to protect other ships, which means any escort missions that have to be done in a, in a time of heightened tension or conflict would have to be done by these ships as well, further taking them away from air defense for the joint force. So we need to think about how do we equip our small surface combatants to go do these escort type missions and these uh, security cooperation missions to take that demand off of our large surface combatants, which are intended to do missile defense type activities. So the, the uh, overall, I would say, the, uh, the, the, missile, the missile threat that the PLA poses to our forces deployed over in the Western Pacific is significant and empowers this, this Chinese strategy of uh, essentially Finlandization of uh, Western Pacific allies that they're attempting. Uh, if the U.S. doesn't have a robust capability to counter that, it tends to reinforce the notion amongst those in, in e East Asia that we are not going to be there to defend them when the time comes to do so. Uh, there's a couple of ways we can go about that. We need to improve the number of missile uh, defenses or the capacity of missile defense within each of our units, and they also need to afford more units to be able to do that missile defense mission. But there's ways to get at that if we're just smart about how we invest. That's it. Thank you so yeah. much. Um, I'm gonna, I've got a couple of questions once again for the panelists, um, but I'm happy to field, probably have time for maybe three, three or four questions if we keep them very brief. And if you could once again um, stand up and say your name and uh, whom you're affiliated with, that would be very helpful. Over here, to the right. Hi, I'm uh, Major Katie Sullivan, I'm an Air Force Fellow. My question's for Mr. Clark. Uh, based on what Mr. Schneider presented for uh, where China is going with their MIRV technology mm -hmm. and your proposal to increase our defense capacity by focusing on short-range defense versus mm -hmm. long-range defense, um, have you done any analysis to show how uh, targeting in terminal phase will, will, will be, how will we improve the capacity to target during terminal right. phase versus boost phase before MIRVs are deployed? Right, so uh, we haven't, I'm working on actually that study right now, but if you look at the, the Homeland Defense kind of mission where you're dealing with the uh, MIRV uh, technology, uh, the idea would be to, you know, they, they're trying to create more targets that we have to shoot down, thus depleting our capacity even further, faster. Uh, General Obring was talking about the importance of this end-to-end -end tracking of the missile. So if we're able to track the incoming missile end-to-end -end from the time it was launched all the way through the time it's merved warheads start to arrive, uh, we can differentiate then between what's the MIRV and what is a decoy or what's the bus and what's the, the missile body. Uh, then you could use a shorter range defensive system to defeat the MIRVs while ignoring the things that are not MIRVs. But the advent of MIRV technology makes it incumbent on you to either have a defensive system that attacks the missile before it MIRVs, which is boost phase or maybe mid-course depending on when it does its, uh, you know, when the bus starts to launch things off, uh, or you have to have this end-to-end -end radar coverage. There's really only kind of two ways to, you know, get at it, I think. Aaron Goodtree, George Washington University. This is probably for Mr. Chang. Yeah, okay. Um, what do you think of Japan's militarization efforts? Will they 
uh, draw an aggressive response from China, an uh, arms race of sorts, or will they sort of continue to treat Japan preferably behind the United States and their interests in the South China Sea? Um, I think that uh, that's something of a false dichotomy. Um, I think that to begin with, the Chinese have, uh, since basically 1945, if not before, uh, viewed Japan with great skepticism. Um, that's a very polite way of saying they are very deeply suspicious, feel threatened by anything the Japanese do, and really don't particularly like the people of Japan. Um, when you have massive rioting because a Japanese soccer team in Manchuria has the uh, impolitic habit of winning, um, and you have to evacuate the soccer team back to Japan so that they don't get beaten up, um, that is a form of mild skepticism of the local Chinese towards Japan. Uh, in that context, um, anything the Japanese do is going to rile China. Um, the fact that the Japanese are reassessing their uh, positions regarding things like Article 9 of the Constitution, uh, restrictions, lifting restrictions on previous interpretations about collective defense is only going to feed what the Chinese themselves have been stoking, which is a mild skepticism of Japan. Um, I don't think that the Chinese, however, view it as Northeast Asia or Southeast Asia. Japan or the South China Sea. I think that the South China Sea, from the Chinese perspective, is Chinese territory, period. Um, you can gussy it up however you want, um, but the Chinese are very good at throwing all sorts of reasons out there about why you should agree that it's Chinese territory. Um, Japan is not Chinese territory, and even the Chinese don't make that claim. Um, but Japan is a, for good historic reasons, viewed with skepticism. And the fact that the U.S. is allied with Japan um, only heightens that set of concerns. Yes, there. Dave Franklin from uh, the Stimson Center. Uh, this question is for uh, Brian Clark. Uh, I enjoyed your analysis uh, with the archers versus arrows, uh, but I noticed that it primarily focused on naval assets. Uh, were you able to look at what air power has to offer as far as uh, long-range standoff on killing archers? Thank right. You. Uh, yeah, great point. So I did look at that. Uh, I didn't want to get into – I was trying to simplify it a little bit. But the uh, if you look at how we use our uh, aircraft today, so we talk a lot about – uh, doing DCA, you know, de defensive counter air capabilities against uh, incoming air threats. Uh, today, we would end up using those systems uh, a surprising amount to defeat cruise missiles coming in that have been launched at even farther distances away. So what we need to do is just, like I had said for the naval part, we need to look at our DCA caps being put in such a location that they'd be able to defeat aircraft before they could launch, uh, kind of like the outer air battle idea from the Cold War. Uh, and I know that that's something the Air Force is looking at, but as we, uh, we've got to th think about what's the best use of our aircraft, which is probably to defeat other aircraft rather than pursuing technologies like air launch hit to kill, which while an attractive way of doing missile defense, maybe is not the best use of a, you know, airplane with a human in it. But yeah, I agree. We need, we need to look at using uh, defensive air, counter air to go after platforms that are trying to launch against us. to uh, upgrades B-52, B-2s, uh, long-range aircraft, and not, not the shorter, shorter range, so thank you. Uh, so d looking at using long-range aircraft to do a counter-air mission, that w well, that's a thing. I had not looked at that uh, very much. So that, that's consistent with some of the uh, study, some of the work we've done at CSBA on the future of air power. And the idea that as air-to-air uh, -air missiles increase their range and as sensors improve, you may be going towards a regime in which uh, you're uh, doing air-to-air -air warfare at well beyond visual range routinely, uh, because the combat ID problem will probably be addressed through new sensor technologies. Uh, and with that, it, the uh, 
the characteristics that would be most valued in future defensive aircraft are going to be payload and sensor capacity. So you're absolutely right. You know, you could look at a platform like the B-52 if uh, equipped with, you know, the sensors that would enable it to see out to the range of the missiles it could carry. It could be a very effective defensive counter-air asset. I have a question for Mark. Um, a, a lot of the uh, conversation here um, most recently has been about what would happen in the event that we actually are in the middle of a conflict with China. But hopefully, we would hope to deter that conflict to begin with. And you, you talked a little bit about um, their, um, their policy of no, no first strike, which has traditionally been China's policy re regarding its nuclear weapons, and now it might be changing that policy a little bit. Um, and then you talked about kind of um, what sorts of missile and nuclear capabilities they may have, but that we're not quite sure about given its tunnel system. Um, how should the United States then think about deterrence as it relates to China? And um, are, we, are we going about it uh, the wrong way? Deterrence of China, I think, is absolutely uh, critical. Uh, it, it's not the largest current threat to the United States, but it will, uh, within the foreseeable future, become that. And it has to be deterred. Uh, I don't think our policies on China are, are working um, very well. Uh, it's not politically correct um, uh, to uh, say that there's a real uh, Chinese threat out there that we have to, to do um, something about. Uh, if you take a look at the overall reductions in, in U.S. military capability um, since the end of the um, Cold War, a lot of the things that we have um, eliminated, uh, very long-range air defense capability for the carriers when the F-14 uh, uh, was eliminated without a re replacement, um, re reducing um, the, uh, or in effect <coughs> canceling U.S. deployment of the uh, low ads, the, the Patriot Pack three uh, replacement system, um, the cancellation of the uh, CGX uh, cruiser. Uh, I think all these things and many, many I can give you many uh, other examples uh, have a, a tremendous effect in in reducing overall U.S. deterrence capabilities, particularly when you take into account the sorts of threats the Chinese are development, uh, developing. Uh, nobody in this panel, for example, has, has mentioned you know, chi Chinese stealth aircraft. That's a brand new threat, and it's a, it's a very difficult um, type of threat to deal with. Now, they probably don't have the same level of, of stealth that U.S. aircraft uh, have, um, but uh, the cancellation of some of our most uh, advanced air defense uh, concepts from the, from the 19... Uh, 90s, uh, I think, has a significant effect in uh, increasing the uh, Chinese ability to threaten the United States. Uh, it's our U.S. forces forward deployed. It's not only the ballistic missile capability. Uh, Mr. Clark's completely accurate here. Uh, it's it's a combination of the air and missile capability. But I think the the missile capability will do a significant amount of defense suppression, uh, and in that we are very likely to run out of. Um, uh, interceptor um, <laughs> missiles before the um, uh, Chinese uh, run out of uh, offensive um, missile capability. Uh, I think the idea of uh, increasing the number of short-range uh, defensive uh, interceptors on, on our um, naval vessels is a good idea, but I don't think it's an absolute panacea, particularly when you take into account that a lot of uh, Chinese capability is dual capable. And uh, against dual capable threats, your very short range air defense systems may not work at all. They're still, they, they're, they have the option of detonating uh, the first nuclear warhead beyond the uh, defensive um, uh, range of, of some of the, uh, the short range terminal defense uh, systems. So um, I, I think uh, we need uh, a much more robust capability. Um, in, in terms of air and missile defense um, assets uh, that we're now procuring. Uh, just how you go about doing that, I mean, uh, it's, a, it's a complex decision-making process and, and you really have to take a look at a lot of technical aspects before you make decisions there. But uh, 
j just rebalancing our forces to a 60-40 split, uh, you know, the, the Pacific versus the Atlantic uh, is not going uh, to, to solve the, the China problem. And uh, I, I recognize right now the Chinese economy is probably a lot weaker position uh, than they were given credit for for a few years ago. Uh, but even so, uh, it doesn't seem to uh, have yet impacted very much uh, Chinese military uh, improvements and expansion. And until it does, I think we've, we've got a very serious uh, threat out there that we're not adequately dealing with. I would just add, too, this was touched on a little bit about cooperating with our allies and expanding missile defense with uh, South Korea and with Japan. We're already doing a lot of great work with both of those countries, in particular Japan. Um, and China has pushed back quite a bit um, as the United States has tried to um, deploy radar, uh, deploy the THAAD battery that um, the United States wants and needs in South Korea. Um, the, the South Koreans want other missile defense capabilities. They're looking at some of the systems the Israelis have deployed and used um, successfully. And so there, there are other assets that our allies want, and China has been very quick to push back on that, saying that, um, that it's destabilizing the region. And um, so always looking for opportunities for the United States to do something different that doesn't cost money. And one of those things would be to, um, to very strongly and robustly defend our allies right to own these systems and make it easier on them um, and not to uh, give in to Chinese um, uh, uh, opposition to some of these deployments like what we have done in the past with Russia and with missile deployments in, um, in Eastern Europe. Um, if I could take uh, one more question uh, from the audience if there, if there is one. And while you're thinking about that, I would just add one more thing that General Obring said I thought was really critical. All of us have kind of talked a little bit about what we could do differently in terms of increasing systems quantitatively, qualitatively. Um, that's going to cost more uh, resources, more money. Um, and in this resource-constrained environment, um, that's going to require some changes um, like, um, you know, dealing with the Budget Control Act and sequestration. Uh, and then General Obring, of course, mentioned that the Missile Defense Agency has really taken on um, a lot of the procurement um, dollars that, um, that are needed to field some of these systems. And, you know, the Missile Defense Agency was, it's a research and development organization, so it needs to get back to research and development to increase these uh, capabilities qualitatively, and then that means the services are going to have to take on the role of, of, of owning these systems, which then, of course, gets back to my first point. We're going to have to give them more resources to do that. Um, so I think that that's a, a point we need to underscore and remember. And if there are no um, further questions, I think you will agree with me that this has been a highly informative um, discussion. And if you'll please join me in thanking our panelists. Thank you.